Hi, Paul. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you too. Oh, there you yeah, are. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm really delighted that you, Dr. Paul, from the University of Warwick, has come to be with us today. It is a great honor for us here at the University of Amba to have you on this Zoom call. In this occasion, I'll quote Hamlet's expression. When he talked to his father at once in five, he said, speak, I'm bound to hear. I want to say that all my students and colleagues who are interested in Shakespeare are not only bound to hear, but also eager to listen to your lecture. I invite my students and colleagues to ask a question if they have any at the end of the talk. Now the time is for you to port speak. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. So let me um, let me just check that. Can everyone hear me? Okay. If if you just say yes in the chat box or or just give me a thumbs up, Majid, maybe. Yeah, okay, <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Well, um, Ramadan Mubarak uh, to you all. And um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, if, if you can't hear me at any point, just maybe write something in the chat box. I can see some of you writing the, things there now. That's really helpful. And um, if I'm going too quickly, if I'm speaking too fast, yeah, just tell me to slow down, okay? Um, so I'm speaking to you now from um, Stratford-upon-Avon in, uh, in Warwickshire in England. And um, just over there is a, a church called Holy Trinity Church, and that's where Shakespeare uh, is buried. So I'm speaking to you very close to Shakespeare, to, to the remains of Shakespeare. And um, I'm just gonna omit some more people now. And it's uh, amazing to me that we, from th hundreds and thousands of miles apart from each other, can meet today um, and talk about Shakespeare, talk about this uh, amazing writer. Um, thank you for your messages saying that you hear and see me very well. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about Hamlet. And I'm going to switch now so I can show you a PowerPoint. And um, let's just see how this works. Yeah. I hope you can see that. Right, so this is a talk uh, about Hamlet, as I, t as I discussed, and um, it's a talk about how Hamlet is an exploration of how we know things and how we don't know things. And I'm just trying to get, there we go. I'm just going to try and arrange my screen so that I can see you as well as the PowerPoint. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's everyone now in the meeting. Yeah, let's have a look. Okay. Yeah, I can, uh, thanks for the message about the 100 participants. Um, we're now at 51 which is wonderful um, and I've got a few questions already which I shall now explain but I think we can I think we can finally just admitting one more people one more person two more people um, but I think we'll make I think we'll make a start now okay okay thank you thank you for your patience uh, so this is a talk about Hamlet, and I'm going to bring up the PowerPoint now again. Okay, 
So, the title of the lecture is Shamlet, um, and it's called Hamlet, Fake News, and the Evidence of the Senses. And I should first explain this word Shamlet. So, some of you may know, in English, a sham is something that is fake. It's something that isn't real. And what I've done is to put the word sham together with Hamlet to create a new word. So it's not a real word. It's a made up word. It's a fake word, shamlet. And what I'm trying to draw attention to there is how Shakespeare's play, Hamlet, has a kind of preoccupation, is very interested in the difference between what is real and what is fake. Okay, so I'm talking about the idea of fake news, which we all know about these days. And I'm going to talk about that in particular in relation to uh, the idea of the evidence of our senses of sight and sound, okay? So this is going to be a lot about um, eyes and ears, okay? So I'm going to start with a, a sign. When I saw a production of Hamlet in Australia once, when I walked into the theater, there was a sign in the theater and it said this, it said, warning, this production contains scenes of simulated violence. Now, the word simulated, as you, will, as you may know, means something that is not real, yeah? A simulation. So this sign was warning the audience that in Hamlet, the, the production they were about to see, that there would be scenes of fake violence. And it's quite a strange warning because obviously when we go to the theater, everything we see is fake. Now, by just talking about the simulated violence, does that mean that we were meant to think everything else was real? It was a very confusing uh, sign to me. Now, what it gets to is something very profound about going to the theater. And that is that when we go to the theater, we go to watch something that is fake. We pay money to people to tell us lies, yeah? To, to give us fake news. And this image that you can see now is a famous image of a, an actor called David Garrick. And David Garrick was the most important actor in the 18th century. And he was a very, very famous actor who played Hamlet. And this moment in the production was his most famous moment. And it was when the ghost of his father came on stage. And what David Garrick did was this kind of response. And at that moment, his hair stood on end. You see his hair there. Now, the way he made his hair do that was by pulling a, a piece of string. He had a little mechanical device that allowed his hair to stand up like that. And 
when audiences saw this, they were amazed by it. On some level, they knew it wasn't real, but they also found it very moving and effective. And in that respect, that's what all theatre does, is it tells us lies, which we take as truth on some level. So, I'm going to say that Hamlet is a play that is very concerned with truth and falsehood and the difficulty of telling the difference between them. And in doing so, it engages with debates from Shakespeare's time, from the early modern period, about skepticism. And skepticism is the question of how we know what we know. How do we know what we know? I'm going to suggest that Hamlet forces us to interpret. It also repeatedly shows its characters in what I'm calling a crisis of interpretation. I'm just going to check the um, participants now. I'm just going to let a few more people in if I can. Uh, not sure I can. Okay, let's just look at the chat to make sure everyone's hearing okay. I think everyone's hearing okay. My, I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't read Arabic, so I'm not sure some of the messages that are happening there, but I hope they're positive, and um, I hope you can all still hear me okay. Um, would you maybe, maybe thumbs up if you can hear me okay still? Yeah. Okay. So right, let me go back to the slide. Okay. So Hamlet is a play about interpretation. And interpretation demands the evidence of our senses. And in Hamlet, this is referred to as the faculties of eyes and ears. Now, why is this so important? Well, in early modern times, they recognized that all evidence, all knowledge, makes its way into us through our senses. And this is, Mich this is Montaigne writing. Montaigne was a French writer. You may have read some of his work, very important writer. And he was, he was alive at roughly the same time as Shakespeare. And Montaigne set himself a challenge of asking himself how he knew what he knows. So Montaigne wrote, all knowledge makes its way into us through the senses. Knowledge begins and ends through them and is resolved through them. But there is no existence that is constant, either of our being or of that of objects. And we and our judgment and all mortal things go on flowing and rolling unceasingly. Thus, nothing certain can be established about one thing by another, both the judging and the judged being in continual change and motion. So the important thing there is Montaigne saying, nothing certain can be established about one thing by another. That's a key problem of skepticism. And I'm, and I'm arguing that this is a key problem that you see all the way through Hamlet, okay? So there's a moment in Hamlet where Hamlet talks about theater as something that is designed to amaze, indeed, the very faculties of eyes and ears. And amaze means something very powerful there. When we, when we use the word amazing now, it doesn't mean that much. It's not a very powerful word. But in Shakespeare's time, 
the word amaze, as you can see from this dictionary, could mean to, to make someone mad, to put someone out of their wits. Um, so amazement is a very powerful idea and that theatre is designed to kind of overwhelm our faculties of eyes and ears. This is an important idea in Hamlet. Think about how much of the play is about theatre and the power of theatre, for example, with Claudius to make him admit his guilt. Now, ears, we're going to talk about ears, <laughs> okay? Um, ears are very important to this play. And you, you hear the word ear many times, many times. So I picked a few examples. I won't spend long, I'll just, I'll just read them quickly. But in the, uh, the second scene of the play, um, in fact, the first scene of the play, I've got that wrong, it's act one, scene one. Um, Bernardo says, sit we down a while and let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story. I'm gonna come back to each of these, but I'll just quickly say them. Hamlet, a little bit later in the play, talks about cleaving, that's cutting, the general ear with horrid speech. When Hamlet is with his mother late in the play and he has a picture of his father and a picture of his uncle and he's comparing them, he says to his mother, here is your husband, Claudius, like a mildewed ear blasting his wholesome brother. Hamlet and Horatio are talking. Um, Horatio says um, that he has a truant disposition and Hamlet says, I would not hear your enemy say so, nor shall you do my ear that violence. The ghost says to Hamlet, so the whole ear of Denmark is by a forged process of my death, rankly abused. Claudius later talks about um, Laertes not wanting buzzers to infect his ear. Okay, so you, you get the point. Ears are mentioned a lot. But the second thing is that nearly every time they are mentioned, it is with um, a violent verb. So assail your ears is like to attack your ears, cleaving the general ear, slicing it. Um, a mildewed ear, we well, skip that one. Nor shall you do my ear that violence, Hamlet says. Um, the whole ear of Denmark is abused. This ear is infected. So, so nearly every time you hear the word ear, it's accompanied by an act of violence. And this is not an accident. Shakespeare, of course, is very thoughtful about how he uses a word when he repeats it and the kinds of words that he surrounds that word with, okay? Now, here is a free resource that you may know about, but I think is very helpful. And it's called um, a concordance. And if you, if you just put into Google or a search engine, Shakespeare concordance, you will find a one, maybe this one at open source Shakespeare, and if you put the word here, H-E-A-R, into the concordance, you will see that that word ha happens 31 times in Hamlet. So what a concordance allows you to do very quickly is to search the amount of times a word occurs in a play, any play of Shakespeare's. And then you can compare the amount of times it occurs across all of his plays. It's very helpful. Okay, so we hear the word here many times in Hamlet. 
And often it's about actually going to the theater. So after the actors arrive and they leave, Hamlet says, follow him friends, we'll hear a play tomorrow. Now we today generally say that we see a play. We do in England anyway, I'm not sure um, but about you, but we usually say we go and watch a film or watch a piece of theater. But in Shakespeare's time, it was just as common to say, hear a play. You go to hear a play. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and you can see this later, whoops, and you can see this when Polonius invites Claudius and Gertrude to come to see the play. He says, he beseech me to entreat your majesties to hear and see the matter. That's important to both hear and see the matter. But then again, Hamlet will also say, will the king hear this piece of work? So, hearing and seeing are very, very important in the play. I'm just gonna check the chat room to make sure if things okay. So someone said there's no voice, um, but I hope, I hope everyone else can hear me still okay. So, uh, we hear you, we hear you. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, so um, hearing and seeing. This is an important quote from another play of Shakespeare's, Henry IV, part one, where a character says, we will not trust our eyes without our ears. And if we look at Thomas Wilson, who's writing a little bit earlier than Shakespeare, he's writing about the art of rhetoric, the art of public speaking. And he says that when a man both hears and sees a thing, he doth remember it much better. So within the culture, there's an idea that you need to both see and hear for something to kind of lodge in your brain, okay? And this is very important in Hamlet. Again, the idea of going to hear a play, this is from, um, again, a piece written around the time of Shakespeare. The writer says, sit in a full theater, sit in a full theater and you will think you see so many lines drawn from the circumference of so many ears whilst the actor is at the center. So we tend to think about sight, sight lines, but here he's thinking about the audience and their ears being drawn to the actor. So we need to remember how important hearing is to Shakespeare and his culture. Now, the play begins in, a, in an atmosphere in which people are not certain what they're hearing or seeing. So again, this is not an accident. Shakespeare designs the play to create a kind of world from the beginning. And this is a world where people are not sure what is happening, what is going on. The first two words of the play, who's there? Who's there? The play begins with a question. And it's a profound question. Who is there? Who is, who are you? And that opening scene continues to ask questions about who people are, what have they seen, and what is the status of the thing that they have seen. So if you remember, the whole reason why um, Horatio is brought into that opening scene is because the other men have seen the ghost, 
but they don't understand what they've seen and they don't trust what they've seen. So they bring Horatio, a student, to confirm what they have seen. And as one of them says, Horatio says, tis but our fantasy. And if, this, if again this apparition, this ghost come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. So they're looking for a kind of collaboration in trying to work out what they've seen. Now, very interestingly, on the ghost's first entrance, the ghost does not speak. The ghost is simply a spectacle. And so they still don't know what the ghost means. They do not know how to interpret the ghost. And in fact, they get their interpretation wrong. They think because the ghost is wearing um, armor, that he's dressed as if for battle, they think that there's going to be a war. So they misinterpret the ghost. And it's only later when Hamlet talks to the ghost and the ghost talks back that we learn why the ghost is haunting Elsinore. And the reason, of course, is revenge. The ghost wants revenge. So the play begins in this atmosphere in which the senses are, are deprived. It's, it's very uncertain what is happening. And this continues throughout the whole play. I'm going to skip that one. Now, there's, a, there's um, a phrase in Hamlet that Hamlet uses where he talks about inexplicable dumb shows. Inexplicable dumb shows. Now, a dumb show, as you know, is a, pe a small piece of theatre that does not have words. It just has a spectacle. And there is a dumb show in Hamlet before the mousetrap, before the play within the play. And one of the reasons why a dumb show is inexplicable is because it doesn't speak. It means that you can interpret a dumb show in lots of different ways because the only sense that is being engaged is your eyesight and not your ears. And I'm gonna give you some examples of dumb shows from the play. And these will show you how the characters in Hamlet are very often confused about what is going on, more than in any other Shakespeare play. So here's a moment from um, the middle of the play, and Hamlet and Hamlet has killed Polonius by accident. And he has this big scene with his mother, with Gertrude. And at the end of the scene, he, he drags Polonius off stage and leaves. And he's, Hamlet says, come sir, to draw toward an end with you. Good night, mother. And he leaves. The next line that we hear spoken is Claudius. Claudius comes in and Claudius says, there's matter in these sighs, these profound heaves. You must translate. Tis fit we understand them. Now, if you look beneath Claudius's um, lines, you can see the act and scene and line reference from the play. And in some editions of Hamlet, there is a scene break between Hamlet leaving and Claudius's next line. 
And in some editions, there is actually an act break. So you go from act three to act four. And I, I think this is crazy. This is crazy because Gertrude is still on stage. When Hamlet leaves with Polonius, he leaves Gertrude and Gertrude is alone on stage. That's what I've tried to indicate with those square brackets in the middle. And of course, she is not saying any words, but she is making noise. And we know that she is making noise because Claudius says, Claudius comes in and he sees Gertrude and Gertrude is clearly making noise because Claudius says, there's matter in these sighs, these profound heaths. So Gertrude is making this noise. Claudius comes in and he sees something he does not understand. He can hear noises, but he does not know what they mean. And so he says to her, you must translate. You must tell me what these noises mean. And that for me is a very typical Hamlet moment. That is a moment that you see throughout the play of people trying to work out what a kind of dumb show means in front of them. Here are some other examples. The ghost in his first entrance is a kind of dumb show, yeah? That's why Hamlet has to say, what, what do you mean? Why is this? Wherefore, what sh should we do? Um, later, we hear about Hamlet going in front of Ophelia. We don't see this, but, but Ophelia reports that Hamlet has come in front of her and acted crazy. Um, and Ophelia and Polonius don't know why. And actually, Polonius gets it wrong. And again, he misinterprets. He thinks that Hamlet's behavior is because Hamlet is mad for, because he loves Ophelia. And Ophelia says, I don't know why he's mad. And then Polonius says, what said he? So that's the important thing is that they're trying to work out what Hamlet means. So Polonius says, well, what did he say? And Ophelia says, well, he didn't say anything. He just has this sigh and then he leaves. So they don't know what he means. That's a very typical Hamlet moment. When Ophelia herself goes mad, um, Everyone at Elsinore can't work out what her speech means. And Horatio says, her speech is nothing. That means it's, it means it's very confused. Yet the unshaped use of it doth move the hearers to collection. Now what that means is that when Ophelia is walking around saying things and singing, that everyone around her <clears throat> has their own interpretation of what she means. She is a dumb show that everyone is trying to interpret, but as is the nature of interpretation, everyone will have different interpretations. So it's just like when we read a book or we discuss a text in class, Everyone has different ideas about what that text means. And in that sense, Ophelia is a text at this moment. She is a text, a living, breathing text that everyone is arguing about how to interpret. Okay, I'm just gonna check the chat just in case there's anything I need to know. Yeah, okay. So the people who want to join the meeting, um, I'm finding it hard to do that. But the good thing is this is being recorded. So, um, 
so I can share the video um, with the professor. And does that make, is that okay? That's okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, so uh, I, yeah, I'm sorry about the people I can't admit, but uh, we will have a recording. I hope, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> okay, so let me just get back to, Okay, so the, um, the mouse trap. Let's just check this. Yeah. So the the play within the play, right in the middle of Hamlet, is the moment where all of these things come together. Everything I have been saying about eyes. Uh, sorry, eyes <laughs> and ears um, and theatre and truth. All of these things come together in the middle of Hamlet in the mousetrap. So the mousetrap is the name that Hamlet gives to the play within the play. And something very strange happens in the mousetrap. You'll remember that the point of the mousetrap is to, is, to, is to make Claudius somehow admit that he is guilty of the murder of his brother. And the way they're gonna try and do that is through theatre, is through, is through fake, <laughs> fake narrative. And in The Mousetrap, you have a, a prologue. So someone comes on and says, hey, this is a play. And then you have a dumb show. And the dumb show is really quite long. And in the dumb show, you see um, a, a husband and wife, and then another guy, and the guy murders the husband, husband dies, other guy marries wife, the widow, yeah. You see everything that happened between Claudius, Gertrude, and Hamlet's father, but it's in a mime, right? There's no language, it's a dumb show. So we're, during the play, within the play, we're all watching Claudius. We're all watching Claudius to see when he'll respond. And it takes him a long time to respond, doesn't it? Because the dumb show seems quite clear. It's quite clearly about someone being poisoned, and, but he doesn't react. Then the play starts, the mouse trap starts properly with words and dialogue. And it's only when you get a few minutes into that that Claudius finally responds. And for uh, many critics have thought, why? Why does it take so long for Claudius? To respond and sometimes they'll the critic would say oh well maybe Claudius um, wasn't looking or paying attention for, for like 10 minutes and then suddenly he starts paying attention to the play within the play but I think it's more intentional than that on Shakespeare's part now if you think about it when he's watching the dumb show, he, like, like everyone else in Hamlet, doesn't quite know what he's looking at. He only has the evidence of his eyes. Then, later, the words of the play go into the ear. 
And as we've already heard, something is more powerful when it goes in both through the eyes and the ears simultaneously. But of course, it's also very appropriate and you can see it here with Alan Bates in um, As Claudius, clutching his ear. Because what he's been reminded of, what these words have reminded him of, is the act of murder that he committed before the play begins. You, you will know that the way that Claudius killed his brother was by poisoning him in his ear yeah so hamlet's father was asleep in his orchard and claudius came in and put this poison in his ear so in a way shakespeare has prepared us for this moment by talking about ears for so long <laughs> Uh, every reference to an ear also has a violent uh, aspect to it. And it's like, it's like everyone on some level at Elsinore knows what the crime is on some level. But at this moment, it's confirmed when Claudius is pierced through his ear. And for early modern people, whoops, the scene of the crime, that's the year. Yeah. Now, we, we're prepared throughout Shakespeare, people talk about words as having a kind of violence, words as poison, words as daggers. So when Hamlet is talking to his mother, and um, being angry with her, she says, stop talking. Oh, speak to me no more. These words like daggers enter in my ears. These words like daggers enter in my ears. Now, words, sound, noise, does have a physical property. If we were in the same room now, if we were all in the same room now, my words would actually hit your ear. They would create sound waves. So there would be a physical connection between us. So that is a, that is a, a biological truth, <laughs> as it were that physically would connect us. And this, this understanding of words being like daggers is like an, ex, it's like, um, it's a kind of recognition of the physical connection that noise and sound makes between us. Now, I, I think that hearing is so important in Hamlet because hearing is something that we are very vulnerable with hearing. With our other senses, we can choose, right? If I want to stop smelling, I can just do that. I can hold my nose. If I want to stop seeing, close my eyes, fine. I could try and block my ears, but we know it's very hard to cancel noise. And similarly, we can choose whether to taste or not to taste, to touch or not to touch, to see or not to see, to be or not to be. We can choose. I think it's very hard with hearing to choose. So, finally, um, I'm not sure what the time is, but we're doing okay. Okay, now, 
this idea that that Hamlet is about seeing and hearing is very important in productions of the play. And many productions of Hamlet now um, will talk about um, will talk about surveillance, about being watched. And Hamlet himself says that Denmark's a prison. Now, many productions in, in, in England recently have, have been about the way our culture is always watching us. There's always a camera. There's always something listening in. Maybe we're being listened to now. Who knows? <laughs> um, now, I just want to finish with this image. So Queen Elizabeth, um, who Shakespeare wrote under. Um, this, is, this is a famous image. And if you look at her dress, you can see that it has ears and eyes on it. Can you, I hope you can see that on the right hand side, that her dress has an ear and an eye. Now, people, people disagree about what that means. People have different interpretations of what that means. But one possible meaning is that she is, she is listening and she is watching all of her people, right? That she has spies. And of course, Hamlet <clears throat> is a play about spies. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are spies. So I think I will probably just leave it there. Well, I'll just come back to the conclusion. Uh, you must translate. You must translate. So Hamlet is a play concerned with truth and falsehood and the difficulty of distinguishing between them. It engages with early modern debates about skepticism and how we know what we know. And I think Hamlet forces all of us to interpret. It also shows its characters having these kind of crises of interpretation. And one thing it teaches us is that interpretation demands the evidence of the senses, the faculties of both eyes and ears. Okay, so I think I shall stop that now and maybe we can go to um, some questions or let me just see if the chat, let's have a look. Please press the button, raise your hand if you are. Oh, yes, okay, you're on. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Paul, thank you very much for this stimulating and engaging lecture. Thank you. Uh, now uh, it's time for questions. I invite my colleagues and students to press, raise your hand if it, is, it will be easier for Dr. Paul to answer. Uh, but before that, I have uh, some questions. I, I, I will start uh, these questions. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is general about the play itself. We, we know that uh, William Shakespeare wrote more than 35 plays. What makes Hamlet a unique one? <laughs> what, a, what a great question. Um, wow. Um, well, I think it, yeah, I think it is and it is not unique. <laughs> um, but what makes it unique? I think it's, I think it's his clearest attempt to write a play about revenge, but with obviously with a character who has no interest in revenge. I think that's different than any other play because in other plays when, when people are revengeful, um, they tend to be quite angry characters. So I think that's one difference. It's, it's the longest play, right? 
that's unique. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. longer. It's longer than any other. There are more words in it. Yeah. Um, I would also finally I would say that while Shakespeare always has references to the theatre in his plays. Hamlet is the play that is most obsessed with theatre. So, so we could do a whole other lecture on, on the role of theatre in the play. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the second question. Uh, oh, as we know, Hamlet as a play is liable to so many interpretations. Uh, related to fake news, uh, I'm concentrating on, uh, on the two characters, uh, the character of Gertrude, Hamlet's mother, and Ophelia, Hamlet's beloved. Yeah, always my students ask me, uh, there is no indication, William Shakespeare didn't give us any indication that Gertrude knows the crime done by the king, by Claudius. So this uh, makes us, an audience, think that uh, Gertrude is a victim. This is from one hand. On the other hand, the hasty marriage leads us to think that Gertrude knows something or uh, Gertrude has a love secret relationship between, between her and Claudius in the life of Hamlet's father. So what, what is your comment on this point? Because my students always ask this question. Mm, yeah, it's, it's really difficult because um, when, you, when you talk to, to an, ac an actress who has played Gertrude, she will tell you that it's a really hard part to play because she has very few lines and because Shakespeare keeps um, keeps things ambiguous about her. So it's very hard for an actress to, to play this role. Um, I'm just letting in some more people finally. Um, I, think, I think we could talk in terms of, um, let us say, strategic ambiguity. And this happens all the way through Shakespeare that he, he actually keeps things ambiguous and difficult to know because in part that is the pleasure of watching the play is trying to work out what motivates a character and Shakespeare generally doesn't like to tell you too explicitly why a character is doing something. Now, it's very interesting with Gertrude because as you may know, uh, everyone, there are, there are different versions of Hamlet. There are different texts that were published during Shakespeare's lifetime. And one of them is called the, the first quarto. And it's often referred to as a bad quarto because there are lots of weird things about it. But it has some interesting things. And one of them is a scene that features Gertrude that is not in other versions of Hamlet and is probably not in the version that you, you have read or that I would read with my students. And in that, in that version, in the first quarto, there's this small scene between Gertrude and Horatio towards the end of the play. And Gertrude, it is revealed to Gertrude that Claudius is a murderer. And Gertrude has this line where she says, oh, wow, <laughs> now I see, now I see. Um, so that in the final scene of the play, she knows that Claudius is guilty. And that changes everything, doesn't it? Because it changes her choice to drink the poison chalice. Maybe, that, maybe she knows it's poisoned. I could send you a link to that scene if it's helpful, because I think it's really interesting, and it's not in most editions of Hamlet. 
but it's a scene that changes Gertrude's character. And it may be that that was what Shakespeare wrote in a first draft of Hamlet, and that somehow that scene got cut, you know, sometime in 1602, 1603, whatever. Um, so it's, it's one of many mysteries. I should, I should let someone else ask a question. I'm seeing a very interesting comment there from, from um, Maui Sami Hussein. Maybe as, as Arabs, we see Hamlet as unique play because it depicts our society from many sides. That's fascinating. I would like to, to hear more about that if anyone would like to speak to that. Or any questions at all? Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, sir. Thanks a lot, Mr. Paul. And thanks a lot for Mr. Majid. This is Mushtaq Abdel Halim Hamad from Al Iraqiya University, College of Arts, Department of English. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I would like uh, to ask a very important question. Uh, can we conclude from your title, uh, according to Hamlet and Shamlet, uh, that there is a kind of relationship, close relationship with the theme of appearances versus reality? Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the question of, of of surface and substance or appearance and reality of what is true and what is false these are absolutely what the play is interested in and again of course anyone who is interested in theatre is interested in these ideas now as I've tried to suggest the paradox of theatre, the paradox of theatre, is that you get to the truth through the false. The appearances can actually get you to the substance. So in, in, in Macbeth, another Shakespeare tragedy, Macbeth talks about lies like truth, lies like truth. And that's what the theater offers, lies like truth. <clears throat> and there's, there's many examples from Shakespeare's time of um, people trying to shut the theaters because they think that theaters are immoral because they lie. And not long after Shakespeare, indeed, the theatres were closed in 1642, in 1640. All of the theatres were closed because they were seen as immoral. Now, what I think what Hamlet, the play, is trying to say is that actually theatre can be very moral. And Hamlet says himself, the purpose of playing, the purpose of theatre, is to hold the mirror up to nature, yeah? That it reflects the reality of a society. So yes, uh, in answer to your question, yes, it is absolutely about appearance and reality, and, uh, but always with this paradox about theatre. I hope that, hope that answers your question. Much appreciated, sir. I've seen a question from um, yeah. Rasha Matik yeah? um, about Ophelia. What does her madness and death symbolise about the kingdom? Wow. That's a good question. <laughs> um, Well, the short answer is that 
something is rotten in the state of Denmark, <laughs> okay? The, the country is diseased. And Ophelia is the victim of that disease. Um, it symbolizes that she is a young woman without power who is manipulated by her father, by the king, um, and, who is, and who is therefore a kind of victim of, of patriarchy, really. Um, and then, of course, Hamlet's own behavior towards her is pretty terrible. So Ophelia is a kind of, she's kind of collateral damage. I mean, she's kind of, she, she's a symbolic victim of this society's inability to value human life, I think. Ophelia's death, as I think, symbolizes death of innocence. Yeah, I think it does. I agree. I think it does symbolize the death of innocence. And even before her death, actually, <clears throat> she's lost her innocence. Um, the songs that she sings, you know, are very sexual. She's, she's seen her own, basically, she's buried her own father. That You know, she's already lost her innocence by the time she dies. And it's an interesting question about Gertrude and the way that Gertrude describes Ophelia's death. And maybe you've talked about this, but Gertrude describes it in this very beautiful speech about the willow and the river. And she makes it really pretty. Romantic. Um, yeah, and um, so, and she's, yeah, so I, I always wonder about that speech and how Gertrude knows and what Gertrude saw. <laughs> it's a good one to discuss, I think. So, it's wonderful. We have 84 people in the room. This is, uh, this is very special. Um, I'm, I'm very, I feel very honored to, um, to have you <laughs> in my kitchen. <laughs> this is my kitchen. <laughs> and, uh, it's raining, it's raining out. I'll show you, it's raining outside in Stratford Avon. I don't know if you can see my garden, but it's raining now. And um, as I said, as I said at the beginning of the talk, but many of you won't have heard, I, I am talking from Stratford upon Avon and um, not very, not very far from where Shakespeare is buried. Um, and I, I, think, I think Shakespeare would have been amazed <laughs> to think about us now having this conversation um, through a little screen. <laughs> I mean, Shakespeare had a very good imagination, but I don't think he could have imagined this happening. <laughs> okay. Dr. Paul, Dr. Yeah. Paul. Uh, you remind me of a very beautiful village of Sradvana Banivan because I visited it in 2016. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm familiar with the, the, the scene of the village. Uh, I have a question. Uh, did, did you, do you think that Ophelia commits suicide? Okay, I think, I think this is back to that strategic ambiguity yeah. yeah and i i think i think ambiguity uh, this is the original uh, originality of william shakespeare to to be ambiguous sometimes it is a positive thing not negative Absol what do you think absolutely yeah because because if you think about it if a work of art is not ambiguous yeah <laughs> it's it's propaganda right or it's or it's yeah. it's for children, that's okay, but for adults, <laughs> we we want to work. We want we want to be engaged and made to work. And it's that that's the point of contact with a work of art, 
is when it reaches out to us and we reach towards it. And um, so I think, I think if, it's very interesting when you compare um, a Shakespeare play with the story or the play that he based it on, okay? So let's just say, um, I mean, Hamlet is a good case in point, but any shape, you know, nearly all of Shakespeare's plays, he, he read about somewhere else. And if you compare the source text with the Shakespeare play, every time he makes things more complicated, in the source text, you might have quite a straightforward character who wants to revenge something and then does it. And I, I, think, I think Shakespeare realizes that that's not actually very interesting. Yeah. Like that, that's a bad movie. Um, and what the, the point of interest is, in, is, when it, is when a character is forced to do something that the character doesn't want to do. Um, and then, then there's another layer where the playwright refuses to explain everything. And Ophelia's death is, is the great example of that. Um, because I'm seeing a very interesting um, comment there about how a mad person can think of committing suicide. So, so if you're insane, are you responsible? You know, is a, is a very profound question. Um, and I think that, um, I think that he wants us to ask questions <laughs> about Ophelia's death. And that's why the play begins with a question, who's there? And it never stops asking questions. I love this, this question, um, is Hamlet's reaction to Ophelia's death true or fake? Now that's a brilliant question. Um, because you always feel in that scene between Hamlet and Laertes at the graveyard, when Hamlet discovers that Ophelia's dead and he and Laertes have that big fight. And um, I always feel that Hamlet is being very insensitive in that scene because suddenly he gets all competitive, doesn't he? He's like, I loved Ophelia, 40,000 brothers, you know, couldn't make up the sum of my love, right? He's getting all, he's getting all competitive with Laertes. Maybe that is fake. Maybe that is, you know, a weird reaction. Um, I'm just seeing another chat here. Someone said about, yeah, the, her death is a collateral damage of the mistakes of others. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, Dr. Paul, I think uh, we have a question uh, by Faisal. He asked, uh, what about Christianity in, in Hamlet? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a big topic. That is a big topic, of course. Um, I think that I think that this problem of skepticism that I've talked about is very relevant to Christianity or to any faith, to any religion. Because that question, who's there? Yeah. Now you can ask, we can ask that of each other, but I think it, we can also ask it about up there, right? Who is up there? Hamlet, Hamlet has got an intellectual training from the University of Wittenberg, okay? Shakespeare makes this change to the story. He makes it clear that Horatio and Hamlet have been to a particular university. And that university was very much associated with, with the Reformation in Europe, with, the pro with Protestantism. And one of the many differences between Protestantism and Catholicism is that the Protestants don't believe in purgatory. 
I don't know if you've discussed any of this, but you know, purgatory is the level between heaven and hell. It's the waiting room that you go to. And it's what Hamlet's father is in. Hamlet's father is in purgatory. Now, for someone like Hamlet, who's skeptical of ghosts and of the kind of superstition that's associated with Catholicism, it's very hard to suddenly meet a ghost <laughs> at the best of times. But if, if, your, if your theological training has told you that there shouldn't be ghosts, then it's even harder. I mean, it's, it's a massive question about the relationship between Christianity and this play, but that's just one way in which it, it comes up. Let's check the messages. Dr. 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 Paul, please, uh, if you please, let Dr. Ahmed uh, let in. Dr. Ahmed is waiting. Oh, sure. Yep, I think I've done that now. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello, new people. <laughs> So many questions. That's great. I'm good. I'm fine. It's the, it's the morning here, you know. I've got nothing else. Yeah. I've got absolutely nothing better to do than, than talk with you guys right now. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Paul Takwa, one of my students asked a question. Is this stage setting realistic or symbolic? Yeah, it's both. It's, it's always both. And again, this, this comes back to this idea, doesn't it? Of, of, um, of, the fake, of the fake and the real. And the point about a Shakespeare stage is that it's, it's, always, it's always fake, it's always symbolic, but it's truthful and real too. So trying to think of a good example of symbolism in Hamlet. Um, Well, it also depends, of course, on what, a, on what a director and a designer want to do with the play. And on Shakespeare's stage originally, um, obviously there wasn't much physical object. There wasn't scenery. It was the same stage for every play, you know, whether it was Hamlet or the Comedy of Errors, it would be the same stage, more or less. But of course, now we get to choose what kind of visual world we put Hamlet in. And some people design Hamlet in a very realistic way, as if it were a kind of realistic drama. And then, of course, you get everything across the spectrum of design to incredibly symbolic designs. Um, so the play, the play is fine. The play can do either. The play is flexible because we are, because we as audience members are flexible, aren't we? We can move between the symbolic and the realistic very easily as human beings. We do that all the time. I hope, that, I hope that's a kind of answer. Yeah, Dr. Paul, there's a question raised by Abdullah. What is the significance of the grape dagger scene in, in Hamlet? Yeah, that's, that's, a great, that's a great question. Um, Shakespeare always, always mixes comedy and tragedy. There is no play of Shakespeare's that doesn't have some combination. And Hamlet is very funny, like throughout the play. It's not, it's not just the grave digger scene that is trying to make us laugh. There are lots and lots of jokes in Hamlet. But what the gravedigger scene does um, is, 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 to, is to make that contrast between comedy and tragedy almost as extreme as it can be. Because again, if we're talking about symbolism, if you have a, a clown, which is what the gravedigger is, he's a clown, a clown in a grave. A clown in a grave. Now that's like Samuel Beckett. Yeah, that's, that's like absurdism. 
That is, that is the darkest humor you can have. So I think, I think thema in terms of the themes of the play, it allows, it allows people to talk about death and mortality and philosophy and memory because one of the functions of the gravedigger scene is to remind Hamlet of Yorick, of the jester, yeah? Alas, poor Yorick. Um, so it's an incredibly rich scene. And I think in a way, it's also designed to allow the audience to relax a little bit. Act four of the play is full of people, of people being very, very emotional. Laertes crying because of the death of his sister, all sorts of stuff. And Shakespeare, Shakespeare always wants to vary the tone whenever he can. So it's what important, what it's important that, um, we'll try and... Um, so it's important that um, if you're going to stand and watch a play or hear a play for three hours, you need variety. You need variety. And what the gravedigger scene does, I think, is to, is to give us a, a, a pause, a relaxation, and then we can go, then we can go into the high drama of Ophelia's funeral and the fight and so on. So it's a great question. I'm still admitting people here. Here we go. All right. Okay. Do we have, um, shall I just go to the next? You tell me. Um, or maybe I shall, hold on. I'll unmute you, um, Professor. Shall I, do you want to choose the next question or shall I? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the next question is by Dr. Jasim. Do we have an implied revenge towards Rosalind and Gildenestirin who proved their infidelity for Shakespeare? Yeah, it's, it is. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small revenge play within the bigger play, isn't it? Again, it, I always think it's weird because I think Hamlet does it very spontaneously, um, according to his own account of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's death. It's like a, it's a snap decision. He sees, he sees that they're taking him to his death. He has this um, small opportunity to switch the letters. Um, so I don't think it's revenge in the sense that you would usually think about that um, as something that is premeditated. That's what revenge usually is. You usually think about it, you plan it, and then you do it. Um, I think the, the death of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, like the death of Polonius, is improvised um, and kind of absurd as well, you know? So, uh, so for me, yeah, so for me, actually, it's not, it's not really about revenge. It's about um, uh, just making something up very quickly to get yourself out of a problem. Yeah. I'm just going to get, another... yeah, yeah, carry on. Water. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's okay. And Dr. Paul, another question is by Ov Alduri. She said, I, I think Shakespeare debates from Aristotelian tragedy. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's partly why, that's, that's one of the reasons why it's interesting. Um, yeah. Because if you, if you think about the way we, we, in, we encounter a text or a play, we have, we have um, expectations of, uh, that might relate to genre, so tragedy, let's say. So we come with these expectations and what the, what the artist does is to fulfill some of those expectations and then to frustrate 
others. And as we watch, we're, there's, there's like at the back of our minds, we're working on this and we're, we're like, ooh, yes, I recognize that bit from another play or from Sophocles or whatever. But then something different happens and we, and we, and we think, oh, that's, that's not what I was expecting. So I think, I think what Shakespeare does, I mean, I d I'm not convinced that Shakespeare cared about Aristotle at all. <laughs> I, you know, I, re I really don't think he, he worried about rules. I think, he, I, think he, I think he saw rules as something that you could bend and play with. So yes, I don't, I don't think he's, I think he is deviating. From Aristotle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another question is by Dr. Ahmed. Uh, he said, uh, as far as tragedy is concerned, what does Shakespeare add to this term? Um, what does he add to tragedy? I think many things, I think. It's a great question. One of them is um, intelligence. <laughs> Is, is, is having the central character in a revenge plot be an intellectual who loves the theater, who loves joking, who's probably quite interested in sex. You know, the, the size of Hamlet's personality, the range of his mind, there is, there's no, real, there's no real precedent for that, it seems to me, in tragedy. That, that personality. And then, and, then, and then I suppose, obviously, the thing that, um, that Shakespeare adds to tragedy is, is a sort of sense of time and duration, that, that, that time can be stretched, that things don't happen um, a, B, C, D, E, that they go A, F, D, G, you know, that the play moves around. Um, that's, that's very weird, <laughs> really. Yes, uh, Dr. Paul, uh, there is an interesting question by, by uh, one of my students. Uh, she said, uh, did Shakespeare attack women in Hamlet? Yeah, that is, well, that's a big question, isn't it? I mean, this is a huge question, isn't it? Because it's, about, it's yeah. about what Shakespeare believed, what he thought about men and women. I personally, okay, I personally think that he's, he, he's, not, he's not successful at his best in this play in writing women. I think that the, both the female parts are underwritten. Um, they don't have enough to do or say, is <laughs> a simple way of putting that. And if a play has two, only two women in it, and both of them end up dead, then you could, you could certainly make the argument that this is a play that, as someone has just written, has a negative attitude towards women. Absolutely. Um, now, in terms of the, Hamlet, the whole history of Hamlet, it's very, and this, is, this removes Shakespeare, right? This is about like the afterlives of the play. It's very interesting that a lot of women have played Hamlet. Um, and this is a tradition that goes back centuries of, of women playing Hamlet. And it's actually quite common now in England for, for, a, for a woman to play Hamlet. Um, and it's certainly very common for women to play Rosencrantz or Guildenstern or uh, whoever. And I think that's interesting. I think that really opens up new ideas that, that Shakespeare didn't intend, but, that, but it doesn't matter because Shakespeare's dead. <laughs> He's over there, right? Um, yeah. And, uh, um, 
you know, I try to talk to him, but he never answers back. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the, the wonderful thing now is that, is that the plays belong to all of us. And we don't have to pay to perform them. Um, and anyone can perform Shakespeare. And that means that if you don't like something about a play, you can rewrite it because that's what Shakespeare did. Yeah. So there are, there are many examples of feminist um, playwrights um, writing new plays that, that challenge Shakespeare, that challenge his depiction of women. Um, and that's great. That's great. Yes, uh, Paul, another question by Dr. Omar Wan. Uh, what is the idea behind such amount of Hamlet's lies, false appearances and deceit that Shakespeare would like to say about his time? Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I, think, I, think he's, I think he's engaging with an intellectual debate about the nature of evidence and how we know what we know. So that's one way he's talking about his times, holding the mirror up to his times. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I think he's, I think he's also responding to, um, a society, a, a city, maybe London, where, you know, there are, there are, everyone is watching each other. If you write a play, the play is going to be read by a, a censor. To, to make sure to approve it for, for performance. Um, many playwrights went to prison. Shakespeare didn't go to prison, as far as we know, but many other playwrights did go to prison. So I think there's a, there's a, he's, he's showing a reality about the time, but it was a dangerous time. It was a dangerous time to be a, an artist. Um, yeah, so, I, so I, it's a, there's a number of ways you could answer that, but that's two, that's two responses. We should go on. Uh, yeah, another question is by Abu Yusuf. Is Hamlet really mad in this play, or is Mary pretended to be mad? <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the old, that's the difficult one, isn't it? Um, I, I think my answer to that is, um, it depends who, who the actor is. Um, I don't think the play will tell you the answer to that, if that makes sense. There's, there's, no, there's no line in the play that can, that can decide that ambiguity. Again, we're back to an ambiguity. I think, I think when you play Hamlet, when you play the role of Hamlet, that is a decision you make for yourself. Um, and I've seen it very convincingly done. That, that actually Hamlet, of course, is so affected by, by the whole situation that he does indeed go mad. But then I've seen other actors where it is clearly a performance of madness. Yeah, that he's faking it. Um, I think both are fine. Yes. Another question is by Professor Haider. Uh, what, what do you think of death of reality in Hamlet? Does it appear as some look um, world? <laughs> yes, that's that's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose in a way, I was I was suggesting that this is a this is one big simulacrum, right? What this thing we call Hamlet, or I'm calling Shamlet. It's it's a kind of a fake world, a fake machine that helps us think and feel, um, but it's not real. It's not real. It's, um, it's a series of words on a page. That's, that's, that's what Hamlet is. Um, uh, it, and yeah, so I, 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 I don't know about the death of reality. I think reality still exists. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> um, but clearly reality, 
consists of a lot of fake things um, and, and simulacra. You know, we're, we're all engaging with each other now via simulacra, simulacra, you know, this isn't me, this isn't quite me. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm, that's a little two, di I'm in two dimensions in a little box. Uh, it reminds me of what Hamlet says, I could be bounded in a, in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. That's what, we're, <laughs> that's what we all look like now. We're, we're bounded in nutshells, but we are also kings and queens of infinite space. Okay, but is it okay for more questions or yeah. are you tired? Absolutely. Yeah, no, great. Yeah, uh, we have a question from uh, Atiyaf Hassan. How did the dumb show scene serve the play? Could you elaborate about the silent language used? Yeah, so, so I think in, in, my, in my reading of the play, that the dumb show has a symbolic function and it's to, it's to demonstrate how just a visual spectacle alone is not enough to create an interpretation. So, so I think that's what the dumb show is about. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but it's also, you know, it's also what people might have expected before a show anyway in those times. But I, I think it is symbolic and I think it's related to everything that I was saying about eyes and ears and so on. Yeah. yeah. Another question is by Ofal Duri. Do you think that Hamlet is a tragic hero or a martyr? Um, well, I mean, I think, uh, I think both. I don't, I don't think they're, I don't think they're mutually exclusive ideas. I think, you know, I think you can be a martyr and a tragic hero. I, I'm not really sure what he's a martyr to, you know, what, what, what his, if he is a martyr, I mean, this would be interesting for you to talk about. What, what, what is the cause of his martyrdom? I'm not sure. I'm not sure there is one. Let me just let some yeah. people in. Go ahead and next question if you like. Yeah, uh, another question is by the same person, by Ofal Duri. She said, do you think that Hamlet is our contemporary in a sense that his character is adopted by many modern dramatists? Yeah, I absolutely do think that Hamlet is our contemporary. I think, if you, if you think about the, the way we describe Shakespeare's period now, we, we describe it as early modern. Certainly, certainly in the UK, we, we, we say the early modern period. Now we used to talk more about the Renaissance. We used to describe it as the Renaissance, but now it's the early modern. And I think early modern is better, a better title. Because if we are now in a postmodern, late modern period, what you can see with the word early modern is that there is a continuity. We're still dealing with many of the same problems psychologically, philosophically, that Shakespeare was wrestling with 400 years ago. Um, so yes, I think, I think in that respect, Shake, Hamlet is always our contemporary. He's all, the play is always asking the questions that we are still asking. And then with the, with the, with the beautiful kind of possibility of theatre and the imagination of directors and actors, um, that, that even further makes Hamlet our contemporary, because like I said, you know, if a, if a young woman now can play Hamlet, um, or, or someone in a wheelchair, or, you know, someone from any part of the globe in any language can play Hamlet, then Hamlet is, is being, is being kind of re-energized to be, to be our contemporary. Yes, uh, Paul, I think no more questions. If we give a chance, there are so many, so many questions about Hamlet. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, should, we, we should do this again. Maybe uh, we should do this again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, uh, uh, th thank you very much for your time. 
uh, we are really appreciate, appreciate uh, your lecture is very interesting, uh, amazing. Uh, and we are here at the University of Amba, we, uh, we are looking forward to more cooperation with you and the University of Warwick. Yeah, I would, I would love that. That would, that. that would be a wonderful thing to come out of these very strange times. Um, you know, that if, if I can't see my mum and dad, <laughs> I can, you know, they, at least we can get together. Um, and um, I thank you all for, for listening and for your uh, excellent questions. And, um, and um, yeah, Ramadan Mubarak um, to, you, to you all. And um, I, hope, I hope we meet again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you for all your nice comments as well. That's very sweet. Okay. I shall end the meeting. <laughs>